Welcome to the Speak Like a Leader podcast with John Bates. Welcome to the show. With me today is someone that, gosh, I guess I've known for quite a while now, and he's someone who is a, a very rare thing in this world. He is a TED fellow, and he's many other things besides that, but one of the things that I love about TED fellows is that there are people that are up to something really special in the world, but they're also always, as part of the selection process, people who are just eclectically interested in the world as well. That seems to be one of the key features in my experience of the people that I've met who are TED fellows. And I think it's even part of the selection process. So I'm very, very excited to introduce you today to Dr. Jimmy Lin. He is the president and founder of the Rare Genomics Institute. You can find them at raregenomics.org. Uh, that's R-A-R-E-G-E-N-O-M-I-C-S dot org. And then you can also find him at drjimmylin.com, D-R-J-I-M-M-Y-L-I-N.com. And uh, Dr. Jimmy Lin is a senior TED fellow. He's got a bunch going on in the world, and he's going to join us now to share some of that stuff. Jimmy, it is great to have you here. Thank you for joining me. No, my pleasure, John. Happy to be here. Cool. Well, so, um, you know, we met through the TED Fellows Program, and you had a, a really you know, I think that that was a pretty special experience for you. You're, you're a senior TED fellow now, but tell us, um, tell us a little bit about how you, you know, got into that, how you got to do that. And then I'd love to hear a little bit about the, you know, the impact that made, I know you got to speak at TED uh, about what you were doing. We'd love to hear a little bit about that. And then, and, and, you know, that was all around rare genomics, which is, Red Genomics Institute, which is a, a really compassionate, important, interesting project. So, so tell us how you you how did you end up being a TED fellow? Yeah, thanks. let's start there. Um, so, my training. Um, I'm a computational biologist by training. Um, now, and did you say complicational? <laughs> computational. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> and, and what that is is, you know, biology is becoming more and more digital. Yeah. Um, so, so a lot of what biology has now become is taking biology, biological information and make it into, you know, computer information. And there needs to be a lot of work to uh, analyze the data. Yeah. Um, so, and I was lucky enough to be part of that really early part of that work. Um, and, you know, we, you know, after the human genome was sequenced, you know, part of the team that started to map the cancer genome, um, did that for multiple different cancers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's really sort of my background. Um, and during my training, so I did my MP PhD at Johns Hopkins. So I finished my PhD working on cancer genomics and, and going back to do my MD um, in my pediatrics rotation. We met a family um, who came from um, all came from all over the, you know, came all the way, I forgot exactly where now, but traveled a long distance and went to all the top academic centers, went to Harvard, went to other places to help this little boy uh, figure out what was wrong um, with, with this little kid. Um, and, and halfway through the examination, the, the, the little boy started to like yell and scream, I'm like, what's going on? And then you know, and it became louder and louder and screaming at the sort of the top of his lungs, like, as if in pain. The mom started to panic um, and like, you know, really tried to sort of calm the boy down, uh, but couldn't. And then she started breaking down crying and say, I'm so sorry to sort of bother you like this. Um, he's always, you know, he, he gets into these tantrums and I don't know what to do. Um, and and we were just there like in shock. I'm like, no, don't worry about it. No. We, we have no idea what you have to go through day in and day out taking care of this little boy. And this little boy was, was you know, very common story where, you know, he grew up very healthy and common, but then all of a sudden started to sort of deteriorate and, you know, starting from a happy, go lucky boy to unable, you know, starting to be more lethargic and able to speak and, and eventually now in this sort of state of being almost in, in chronic pain. So 
it, it was, you know, and I was just still a med student then, um, mm-hmm. and having just worked on the genomics projects, and I, you know, I was very, you know, bright eyed, um, and said, okay, well, now they've been to, at Johns Hopkins, we're one of the top medical centers in the world, so we'll, we'll be able to find out what's going going on. So, we, you know, we did all the interviews with the family and went to the back room. So I, so I asked the doctor, uh, who's the attending physician. So you know, what can we do? You know, we are we're Johns Hopkins. Uh, can we figure something out to help this family? Um, and the doctor was you know looking through all the charts. We looked at all of the you know from other hospitals as well. Um, and basically, the doctor said, you know what? I don't think there's anything we can do. And and I was in shock. Like wow. Yeah. Um, like you know, and then you know there was a thought of this bit genetic disease, but they all got it checked. Um, so I remember sort of walking out um, and and um, already shocked, but then the doctor had to tell the family, um, especially the mom, like, you know what, mm. like, you know, there's, and so unfortunately, all the tests that we would have done, the other academic centers have already done. Um, we can help su- support you with, you know, supportive care, but there's no additional testing that we feel like we can do. And I just remember that mom's face, like, drop, oh. you know, at the loss of hope. Um, and then, and then this was a, um, so this was, I believe, uh, an Indian family. I, and I didn't remember exactly the ethnicity, um, but, but, if, um, but they, they, there was a big family that all came together. Mm. Um, and I, I remember that whole family then sort of walking down the hallway with their backs away from me and sort of, you know, head trooped down um, and just sort of maybe they're going to look at trying to find answers at the next academic center. And then that's when I started to talk to the doctor, like, you know what, like, if we think that this is a genetic disease, you know, if I've helped sequence cancer genomes, um, why don't we sequence this child's genome to figure out what's going on? And this is at the very beginning of the genomics revolution. We, you know, we barely started to do it. It took took billions of dollars to do the first ones. And for us, even parts of it, you know, millions of dollars. And he's he's like, well, you know, it's too expensive. There's not no technology for that. Um, But, you know, it could potentially help. So that really then set me on a track to figure out how are ways that we can help families like this. Um, there was a sharp drop in the price of sequencing um, mm-hmm. of, of DNA, um, and we started to sort of get to work. So I started to call all my friends at you know talk at academic centers and says, you know what, what can we do to help? Um, if I if I know the technology, I've worked at it in cancer. How do we use these for these sort of undiagnosed um, and rare diseases? So that's what we started to do. Um, and then so we, we were able to find the top researchers to be able to do that. But then we needed to find funding. And this is at the start of Kickstarter. Oh, uh, wow. Plus years ago. Uh, one of my friends, is, you know, the, the, one of the founders of Kickstarter um, is a TED fellow, too. Um, and one of my friends also helped on, on another of the Kickstarting um, platforms. So we thought, you know what? We can, we can use crowdfunding, which is sort of brand new, instead of crowdfunding for you know, new games or new products, um, we can do this for these families, you know? Um, yeah. And and instead of, right, um, just donating to a, a disease nonprofit that um, you don't know what's going on, you can actually literally, dis- you know, your aunts and uncles can dono- donate little sums of money to be able to help someone they really know. Yeah. And you can start these research projects. <laughs> we started doing that um, one at a time. Um, yeah. So, um, we started doing this, uh, figuring out, you know, what families need our help and figuring out what academic centers at Harvard and Yale and Baylor College of Medicine and Duke. Um, and people were willing to help. And then we had the funding to do it. And if we had to figure out, you know, regulatory wise, what can we com- communicate and what's research and what's clinical. But we were able to navigate all those and starting to sort of help these patients one at a time. Um, and, and that's when, you know, um, was able to sort of get the attention of Ted and became a Ted fellow there. Um, and, and it's cool because, you know, we, we, we started to get the word out, but again, it was one at a time. And I spoke at the 2012 Ted conference yeah. um, and that's when the reporters really sort of, you know, took on to the story and multiple different sort of national, international outlets started covering us. So then we had then had a overwhelming response from all over the world who, you know, families who wanted their, their kids help helped and then um and then you know also sort of launching our and helping them launch, launch crowdfunding campaigns to be able to do that so it's been it's been uh, pretty amazing we've, we've discovered you know some new diseases n- p- p- never found before yeah um, we, we've helped you know find some diagnoses many of them unfortunately it's we, we have sort of top candidates 
Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a long journey to yeah. find a game to for ultimate sort of uh, making an impact. But, but we've had, you know, um, we've heard amazing stories and every, every story that we work on um, is, 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 is a whole family. And, and um, it's pretty amazing that um, a lot of the scientists we work with uh, who are basic scientists don't, aren't able to see many of their basic science methods um, have impact on yeah. patients because um, it's often a long road. And this is a small way to be able to connect scientists who want to make an impact um, to families yeah. who really need it. Um, well, and, and there's a, I think that there's an important story in the name rare genomics, right? Like where does, the, I mean, do you want to say a little bit more about why that name? Yeah, so um, obviously um, it's, it's focusing on, on rare diseases. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the problem with rare diseases is due to the fact that they're rare. Yeah. Um, when, they, when you talk to them in separate, there are very few. However, if you add them up, there's over 7,000 rare diseases affecting um, up to, depending on how you count, you know, one in 10 people in the world. So, so um, there's a lot of these diseases that are sort of long tail problems. Um, and the internet is really good at working a long tail, right? You know, yeah. Amazon. And, and so, so for, if you're able to sort of create a platform to really consolidate these rare diseases, um, this is where we can make an impact. So this is rare and genomics, right? So genomics yeah. is the amazing revolution that's happened when, you know, we started from sequence and genome for billions of dollars and eventually now down to thousands of dollars. Um, so it's sort of a simple combination of those ideas. And you know, I have a like. So tell me how close I am on this. But I, on on, I've been thinking about this a lot because of the people that I work with. Uh, and I don't know how medicine did it before the genomic revolution and realizations about the microbiome. I mean, it just it all gets so intensely complex. It's almost like, you know, it's almost like every disease is a rare disease because it's in an individual human being with a unique expression of all these different things. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, historical medicine, I mean, until most recently, uh, medicine really was, was really dependent on your physician. So I, I, I have the privilege of working with some amazing, amazing, um, Physicians, you know, almost like Dr. House, right? They, they can see one little thing that has, you know, one little symptom and be able to figure, figure it out. But that, um, those are very far and few in between, right? Yeah. Uh, and and those, you know, a lot of experience, a lot of learning uh, yeah. to be able to do that. And some of them are pretty amazing. Um, and yeah. within the last sort of 100, 200 years, I think medicine has become much, much more a science, um, yeah. you know, in, integrating like uh, autopsies and pathology. Um, um, and be able to sort of do, you know, um, really making it a scientific endeavor and doing experiments. And yeah. within the last, you know, 50 years with the rise of, you know, sequencing and genomics, we're really starting to be able to leverage things that the human brain, the patterns that human brains can recognize and things that we can't see with our eyes and, and touch with our hands um, yeah. and be able to sort of really make all this information large scale and, and you know, combined with all the the ways that you know doctors ask about history take history and, and notice about the symptoms makes it a combined a really powerful tool yeah so may i ask a little bit about your experience um cuz you know in 2012 you spoke at ted right yeah so yeah. so tell us a little bit about the lead up to that and anything interesting that you got in your coaching from ted or any of that that you think is worth sharing and then tell us a little bit about what that experience was like, including, you know, what it felt like to be on that stage, looking out, knowing who was in the audience and they were all there live looking at you. Yeah. So uh, 2012, I know, I know Ted is almost a household name these days, but 2012, Ted is still, was still pretty niche. Uh, Yeah. It was. uh, You have to explain to people what Ted was. Um, Yes. yeah, I mean, I, I would ask people who's heard of Ted, and a few hands would go up. You know, yeah, that was um, it. It was, you know. Um, so again, it was sort of pretty niche. Um, so you know, we we you know did a, did a lot of preparation that I could on my own. Um, we we had great coaching um, that the program provided as well, mm-hmm. um, and and you know, like, um, um, but it was it was sort of more you know um, real time coaching. Right. Yeah. Uh, we went and practiced and figured out um, 
Um, and and that, so so yeah, um, gave the first talk. Uh, it, it went it went really well, uh, um, and I'm pretty excited. I got a TED. There's a lot of standing ovations, but but I got the yeah. I got a standing ovation. You know that's pretty amazing. You know it's nothing to sneeze yeah. at. A standing yeah. ovation at uh, TED is a big deal. To see that um, and doing it in a very short amount of time, right? Um, yeah. How after, long was your speech, Jimmy? I think eight minutes. Yeah, which is uh, not. I mean, that goes so fast. If people, if you've never given an eight minute, I mean, I think anybody who's never actually had to do it would be surprised at how fast that goes. It's it's incredibly fast. And then um, we also had um, Nancy Duarte uh, come yeah. and help us coach. She's so a hero of mine. She's she's amazing. And um, she listened to my talk that I prepared for months. Um, and then <laughs> like, two days before the talk, she's like, Jimmy, like. Um, she asked me the story, and then the one of the story that I just told you. And she's like, yeah. "Give me like your talk is so much technical language. You need to give people heart and tell the story of why yeah. you even got into this." Yeah. So she she basically helped me sort of rewrite my entire talk yeah. Yeah. two days before the actual sort of presentation, and it was it was a mad scramble, but um, yeah. but you know it, it eventually um, turned out to be fine and really well received. Yeah. Um, well, I think the good lesson there is that if you're going to speak at something like TED, block out two or three days before it happens and don't have anything on your calendar just in case. <laughs> totally. No, 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 no. So again, um, now I've given, you know, I don't know, maybe a dozen or more TED and TEDx talks, including the ones that you helped me, you coached me as well. Jim. Yeah, um, that was a blast. Um, yeah, at, at, um, at TED U. But um but but again, the, the amount of preparation now that people put into these talks, yeah. um, and the amount that I did in my you know yeah. the, the latest sort of TED main TED talk that I gave, it, it literally I spent hundreds of hours. I, I um, think people would be shocked yeah. at how much time it really takes to get something that good. Yeah, and then there's um. Uh, hundreds of hours. I just want to reinforce yeah. that you actually said that. Yes. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, easily hundreds of hours. <laughs> um, and I do a lot of public speaking. Um, so yeah, yeah. No, it's not like I do a lot of hack. speaking. Um, I've spoken all around the world. This is, you know, another talk. It should, you know, it's only eight minutes. Um, uh, only, you know, it should be pretty simple. <laughs> um, but you know, to make it into this sort of tight, concise talk, it's a whole different sort yeah. of set up. So, you know, my, yeah, like I said, the latest one is going from just sort of a, you know, impromptu talk about, you know, some, some topic um, that, you know, with some slides you throw up, but like, you know, literally crafting every single word and every sentence yeah. um, to fit the most information in the clearest manner and take away anything that's extraneous yeah. uh, that fits to the imaging. And, um, and then, yeah, literally we were, you know, which word is in, which word is out. And then working on like memorization and it usually it gets worse before it gets better. Yeah. That's a good uh, point. That's uh, a good point. And then, and then um, so, I mean, one of the inspirations for me is, you know, knowing that, you know, Steve Jobs is known for his great public speaking. Yeah. He spends like entire weeks sometimes just preparing for his keynotes. Um, he would spend yeah. an hour practicing after they wrote the talk, right? With that, yeah. which takes a really long time to start with. Then he yeah. would spend an hour for every minute. Yeah. And practicing, just practicing the finished talk. And you know who else did that? Winston Churchill. Huh. So, you know, there's a couple of, <laughs> like, if you want to be a good public speaker, those are two people that you might want to emulate, right? Totally. So, yeah, and that's a big learning of mine is, you know, I thought, oh, um, I've, I've done so much of this. Um, yeah. It was rather naturally for me. And, you know, it's another talk. But, again, <laughs> it's, it's a different, you know, um, making a really tight, um, concise, and clear talk is, is, is something completely different. Um, and, and, you know, and literally the, some people try a little bit harder, right? Like they, oh, they try to write a script, but then, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's this sort of valley again, it gets worse yeah. before it gets yeah. better and then they sort yeah. of give up and go back to their original ways. And, you know, yeah. there's times I've done that, but then if you really persist and go through, you'll, you'll see, you know, it gets worse, but eventually then it becomes exponentially better. Yeah. Exponentially. And, you know, I talk about that a lot in my trainings and I say there, you know, I, w when I realized that I was getting, so I, I, I think, tell me what you think of this. I, I've realized recently I suffered really badly 
from a problem that doesn't sound like a problem. But for a long time, Jimmy, I was the best speaker at the conference. And if I wasn't the best, I was in the top three. And usually I was the best. Um, and the problem with that is that the bar at those conferences was so incredibly low, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so if I was going to be satisfied with that, I would never, ever reach my full potential. And when I realized that like winging it was not going to be the way that I got to my full potential, I had that problem, right? I practiced so much that it looked like I practiced a lot. Man, that's not the goal, right? Yeah. Like, oh, that guy looks like he practiced a lot. That's not great. <laughs> And then there's this thing that I call in honor of Chris Anderson, the, the awkward, the Valley of awkwardness mm -hmm. and to get across that just takes more practice. There exactly. is a place where you practice so much that it looks like you didn't practice, right? Exactly. Exactly. No, a hundred percent. And that's where that canny, um, and it, it took a, a lot of, you know, um, doing this a lot of times to sort of really sort of <laughs> figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then. What is, so when you look back on the talks that you've done, where it was hot, like the high stakes talks, right? Do you regret practicing that much? Uh, never. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, again, it's, um, you, you need, uh, like, like you say, you need to sort of cross that amount um, yeah. of, of practice. Um, again, because I've, you know, given also a lot of TEDx talks. Yeah, uh, and many of them actually, you know, I, I just sort of take the same content because they just wanted me to give this some more talk. Yeah, um, um, so I, I have the benefit of even doing more practice on talks that I've given and practice already a lot. Um, yeah, and I can see the difference actually, even though I've practiced so much. <laughs> yeah, you know, from the first time, and then I do it a second time, a third time when I do practice. Yeah, uh, how it sort of becomes even better. Um, so it's better. Yeah. yeah. Well, and this is one of those places, and I'd I'd love to know if your if your experience backs this up. But what I th see for myself and for my clients is that when you practice something that much, how I say it is, you you walk up on stage and you now come across as a total expert in your talk, right? And that's completely within your control. You can, that is absolutely possible, right? To be an expert in your own talk. But when you come across as a total expert in your own talk, it puts this halo on you and people tend to kind of give you the benefit of the doubt, like you're an expert in everything else too, which is not logical, but it's how it works, you know? Yeah, and and I, I maybe mean, adding a little bit more. It's it's not just practice. Um, uh -huh. It's writing the different versions of your content. Yes. Um, yeah. And then having um, different people um, view it and see whether they understand it for different audiences. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know how many versions. Uh, you know, probably 30, 40 different versions um, of, of talks that I've written. So you know, yeah. To iterate. Uh, and then, yeah. Um, um, because uh, getting to the right audience and getting the right feedback. Yeah, through, um, and and making that, that content. So it's um, the preparation, the time of preparation is, is significant, and then yeah. getting the right talk, and then and then yeah, the practice and a continued iteration. Like you know, yeah. the words here, you know, this doesn't fit, this isn't. Yeah, you know, um, and and continue to hone hone that craft. And do you um, practice out loud, Jimmy? Oh, you know, hundred percent have to. Um, Only way, yeah, um, out loud, recorded. Um, um, and then to see yourself, it's, it's hard. People don't want to do that, <laughs> no, yeah. do that a lot. Um, and again, there's this, there, there's a, there's a point where, uh, there, there's too much, like, you know, I, I'm yeah. not a professional speaker in that sense, Yeah. Uh, but, but there's aspects of it. You sort of need to just decide like, you know, how, how important is this talk and, yes. and, and how many people will see it and what's the, you know, I usually sort of calculate, um, you know, what's the number of hours of people that will see it? Like, you know, yeah. I've spoken as large as, you know, uh, five, 10,000 person stadiums. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there, you know, and multiply the time out, you know, there's a lot of yeah. people sort of, you know, listening. So yeah, you know, sort of dedicate time for the a larger audience, or if it's going to be something that's used on, on websites and evergreen, that's going to yeah. be. So people need to decide how much, you know, you don't want to, you know, there's ultimately, you know, I, I, I do need to spend my time actually doing the science and helping the kids, which is. Yes. Very yes. So there's yes. going to be a trade off. But um, the, the getting the message out was very important for us so that more families can be helped because they know about it, um, yeah. as well as more scientists and as, um, 
um, and researchers would sort of come alongside us as well. So, so there was sort of a balance of trying to sort of figure out what that was. But again, with, with the right sort of um, design of how much we want to give to it, then, you know, give it as much as we can um, yeah. in terms of that time to make that talk just amazing. I love it. And, you know, I call that the Bates equation because I'm slightly narcissistic and not very creative, right? Like one times 20 times 3000, that's 60,000 minutes of human life that I'm consuming in one 20 minute talk to 3000 people divide Uh by 60. That's a thousand hours. Then you get someone like you in a stadium with 10,000 people, right? That's now 3000 plus hours of human life that that one 20 minute talk consumes. And I just think it's worth preparing commensurate with that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. 100%. That. And I especially that. now with internet, right? Like, uh, you know, if, if it's a video, you, you, you know, expect, you want yeah. lots of people yeah. to, to do that, you know, spending time to, to do that and um, making that craft is going to, you know, and especially, you know, depending on the mission people are on, right? Um, yeah. uh, it's the medium to sort of communicate the mission. And for us, helping these, you know, these families with rare disease is very, very important. Yes. Um, and, and so that we want to do that. Um, but if you look at the internet in general, people are just doing, doing it even just for uh, entertainment and they spend so much time on it. Yeah. So, on a mission. so, you know, many potentially um, of, of, of your listeners have a message they you know really think that they want to get out to help lots of people that's even the more important um, yes to spend time um, to be able to convey that message yeah so what are some of the things that are that are kind of occupying your your kind of more general thoughts these days as you like because you're on the cutting edge of genomics and you're on the cutting edge of that whole world like, are, are you seeing things that are still around the corner for people like us? Is there anything kind of new and exciting or interesting or strange or anything that you're seeing and noticing? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, <laughs> without, I mean, this is one of the most exciting times in, in biotech uh, in general. Yeah. Um, within rare diseases, I think that the cool thing is, you know, since 2012, what we thought was, you know, these Herculean scientific projects that we're doing, you know, getting, you know, helping crowdfund and at talk academic centers. This is now a lot of the time is now is a standard of care. Um, well, I mean, is, I, yeah. I got flashes genome sequenced. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so. So now it's standard of care, which is amazing. And, and more and more sort of insurance companies are doing that. So, what we, you know, what was very, very hard is, is, is now. Um, so, and then we have top sponsors, from genome sequencing companies that, you know, we don't even have to crowdfund anymore. Yeah. Uh, and, wow. Uh, that's, of um, course, that's awesome. Yeah. Wow. But then the next sort of the phase for our families is, you know, um, many times you can't figure out um, um, what's the, you know, now we're hosting with whole genomes. We're looking at tens of thousands of variants to sort of sift through. Yeah. And, look, and it's still very, very hard. So there's yeah. still a lot of different, um, sequencing is only the beginning. Uh, interpretation, yeah. finding the right yeah. variant, and we worked with multiple different um, uh, AI and machine learning companies to, you know, and a lot of human effort to help now sift through all that data uh, yeah. for our patients. And then if we find potential, um, you know, variants that are causing disease, then we sort of take the next step. You know, we create. Mm-hmm help create, you know, cell lines or mouse models and test out the biology. Like, does this actually cause yeah. that? So yeah. we've done that. Um, we're doing a lot more now of um, using digital health as well. So um, now that we can do genotyping, which is figuring out all the genes, we're not very good at what's called phenotyping. It's sort of measuring no. the day-to-day activity. So a lot of these kids um, are just, oh, they're, they're just sort of neurologically delayed. But then what does that look like? Um, so how do we measure that better? Um, so, you know, there's a rise in wearables often used for more just health tracking, but, yeah. uh, but there's a wearables and, and, um, even, you know, looking at, um, ways to not just sort of track steps, but, you know, heartbeat and breathing and oxygenation and, you know, um, EEG, there's so much yeah. now that, you know, you mean, look at the Apple watch, it's now sort of, you know, so consumer make it such a consumer product but a lot of it on the medical side still is now we're starting to really phenotype um, these kids uh, yeah. much much better um, to be able to really understand this data so we're we're just just at the very beginning um, yeah. of the beginning of sort of understanding our genome 
uh, yeah. the genome sequence, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, but that was really only sort of one or a handful, well, about a dozen reference genomes. And yeah. we know that everybody's genome is different. Yeah. Um, and we're just now starting to understand what every base pair in the three billion base pairs of our genome, what does that mean? And we still, um, we're just starting. Um, it's, you know, we're discovering, you know, many of these genes and what they do really for the first time. Um, and then now figuring out what's, what's down, um, downstream from that. And we've gone now from reading to writing uh -huh. genomes. So uh -huh. um, there's synthetic biology, so we can start yeah. creating, um, ge uh, printing genomes um, from scratch, which is really exciting. We can edit genomes, so uh -huh. any of your viewers can probably you know know of CRISPR, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I genomes. mean, which is exciting and probably one of the scariest things in the world to me. Yeah, I, um, you know, so again, <laughs> um, it's it's what you do with it. But we've been able to edit genomes for for a while. Um, we've mm -hmm. had enzymes and zinc fingers but mm. CRISPR is the first way that we can edit genomes um, really easily meaning we can sort of instead of creating a, a special enzyme just to do one change we can almost sort of program you know, yeah. CRISPR to be able to sort of make a very specific change so that's why yeah. the excitement around CRISPR and doing that and then looking at you know, there's many different CRISPR you know types and looking at off, off target effects so, so that's you know we're reading we're editing we're writing genomes um, much, much, you know, better now. Um, but I think we're going much beyond just sort of DNA and a nucleotide. Um, there's a lot of work now on, on whole cells. So mm -hmm. um, people are using cellular therapy, uh, reprogramming yeah. cells to be able wow. to sometimes reprogramming viruses to be able to do that. So we're within the, the therapeutic side, there's whole new modalities of medicine. In the past, we were mostly using chemicals. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're using, you know, nucleotides and RNA and whole cells. And yeah. um, um, it's there's literally a big, big explosion of different, not just drugs, but whole new modalities of drugs yeah. um, that, that are now being, you know, used for the first time. So this is a really exciting time for for biologists in general. Um, yeah. And, and, um, and we're, we're just at the beginning of the beginning. Yeah. That's so wild. You know, as an aside, and I don't know if I should admit this in public, uh, but I uh, I have more Neanderthal DNA than 98.2% of everybody on 23andMe. And I uh -huh. actually have way more than anybody in my family, including my parents. Like somehow, you know, I got everything from both of them and ended up with more, more Neanderthal DNA than, than either of them have. Huh. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, or maybe it's just a non-judgmental thing, but um, it is kind of interesting. Yeah, no, okay. We, we, we don't know. And that's, you know, a lot of, we're just starting, right? 23 me is a version yeah. of it. And, and most of the, the things uh, it are still just under investigation as we yeah. figure out what, what any of those sort of variants are. Yeah. Well, so, Jimmy, what uh, what are you, you know, I, I mean, I, I I guess people can go to raregenomics.org. People can go to drjimmylin.com. Is there anything that you would want people who heard this to do? I mean, can they go see if there's something at Rare Genomics that they'd like to contribute to? Is, you know, anything that you would ask of of our audience here? Yeah, of course. If, if people are, you know, they can learn about our project if they're interested. You know, uh, you know, a, a donation obviously will be welcome. Um, yeah. Um, to be able to help some of these diseases, we're we're no longer donating directly to the kids, but uh -huh. um, but you know, donating to the organization. But but yeah. I think the the main thing is I think for your audience is, um, um, I think as as you're, you know, you've helped me in terms of getting my message out. Um, I'm sure your audience have have. A lot of great messages they want to get out as well, um, and the encouragement will be, you know, hone that craft. Um, and if it's a me message worthy of getting out, um, a cause that's worthy of getting people around, um, yeah. spending time to be able to um, communicate that in a clear fashion, um, and to be able to help people. Um, communication is pretty amazing because you can basically infect people with your idea. Yes. Right? Wow. Well um, said. Yeah. Um, so so figure out ways to do that, to spread your idea. Um, that That is, of if it's important to you, it's probably, you know, of great value then to figure out ways to then help other people get onto it. And and these ideas of influence, whether it's sort of political, um, whether it's, you know, scientific, you know, whether 
Um, it, it's for philanthropic reasons um, or even just commercial um, in the past. But, but the, the power of the idea is, is something that obviously, you know, Ted has embraced. Yes. Uh, and, and which is very, very important. So if you think you have a good idea worthy of spreading, definitely spend time to hone that craft, craft to get the idea out. Yeah. Well, uh, that's fabulous. That's fabulous to hear from you because uh, you can you can make that call to people because you have thrown down and really put your money where your mouth is and done that much more than once. So uh, so I think that if, you know, to those of you that are listening, uh, you know, I can attest to the fact that Dr. Jimmy Lin puts his money where his mouth is. And, uh, and I think that that's really a, a great, I think that's great advice, Jimmy. And I think that's a great call to action. Um, you know, cause you're totally right. What a, what a, it's so powerful. It's the thing people want to be infected by, you know, a great idea. You can yeah. infect others with your idea, which is just, boy, that's the thing to do. Yeah. Um, well, Jimmy, is there anything else you'd like to say? I know we're coming to the top of the hour and I got to let you go, even though I don't want to. Maybe we No, I want to thank you for all your help on my, on my journey um, and, and excited about the people that you're helping um, in, in your efforts and getting your idea out as well. Awesome. Thank you, Jimmy. Well, I really, really appreciate you joining us. And to those of you uh, listening, thank you for joining us. Uh, this this wouldn't be nearly as exciting without you, even though I would love catching up with Jimmy either way. But, uh, you know, I think that, I think that um, Jimmy is a really great example of the power of committing time to your communication versus just spending all your time working on your idea. You know, if, if you've got a great idea and you've got a great project and it doesn't get out into the world, then it just has limited power. But boy, when you give that time and effort to getting it out into the world too. And like you said, you know, like Jimmy said, it takes a certain time away from the science, right? But that time that it takes away, I think it, if you do it well and you do it right, it pays that back many fold. Right. So always a balancing act, but worth, I think the balancing act usually falls short of on the communication side versus on the science side. So that's why I'm always pulling people over to communication. So Jimmy, thank you. I thank look you. forward to talking with you again, and I wish you all the best. If there's ever anything I can do, you know, you have my cell phone. So please. All right. And okay. thank you all for joining us on speak like a leader dot show. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it out. We'd love to reach more people with these great messages and thanks for joining us. Thank you for joining the speak like a leader podcast. Go be awesome. Awesome.